is the author of Radiance of Tomorrow, and Oreva is the author of Absolution. Um, I'd like us to start from common themes in their book before they read and you know, then um, talk further. Both books are about, there's a common thread of memory and trauma in both books and about how people deal with trauma as individuals and as communities. Um, and Ishmael, I wanted you to talk about why you decided to revisit um, the, the aftermath of the Sierra Leonean war. You said you didn't want to write a memoir again, but when I was reading Radiance of Tomorrow, it felt like I was reading a continuation of sorts of Long Way Gone. It was a long way gone. It was sort of closure for me, like knowing what, what happened after, the, what, what the lives of people were like afterwards. But this is fiction, so I want you to talk about why you decided to use fiction as the tool for telling this story and um, how that was like for you. Did you have to revisit personal experiences in doing so? All right, um, thank you very much. And uh, before I, I start to say anything, I, I want to thank you for being sticking around all day. You know, it's, it's, um, it's always wonderful for writers. Uh, we spend a lot of time in solitude and we have people like you who just want to <laughs> listen to us. <laughs> so it's, thank you. Um, perhaps the context would be that my, my first book was a memoir, which was a story that uh, was really pulling at me and it's something that I wanted to tell first even though I had written fiction, uh, short stories mostly. Um, but writing the, the, the Radiance of Tomorrow, which is a novel, came out of this desire to touch on a subject that I felt was ignored, which is that uh, there's a lot of interest, particularly in the international media, about when something is going wrong in a specific country. In Sierra Leone, when we had a civil war, everybody was talking about Sierra Leone. As soon as the war ended, the cameras went to the next horrific situation around the world. And, but that was when the work began, when people returned after war, after difficulties, how do they learn to live again? Can they embrace the traditions that they had, had before? If not, what do they define themselves? How do they define themselves? What kind of traditions? So these questions were what I wanted to answer, and I knew that Answering it personally would not work because I wanted a lot of nuances. So I decided to create a fictional uh, characters to answer some of these questions. Uh, so I use my imagination, I use observation, uh, I use different things and I embarked on writing what became uh, Radiance of Tomorrow. Yeah. Um, any personal stories? Did you have to revisit places yourself or it was purely no, I did visit places. I'd also been going back to my own country in Sierra Leone right after the war ended. I was able to leave while the war was still going on to escape, really. Um, but I went back and I'd realized how things had changed. You know, for example, on a very simple note, uh, before the war, if you were in the rural area of my country and you saw a young man with a machete, walking the path into town or into a village, you would not flinch, you would not think about anything. You would assume that your imagination, your psychological makeup was that they were coming from the farm. But after the war, because during the war in Sierra Leone, machetes were used to chop people's hands off, when you saw a, a young man with a machete after the war, there was another thing added to that uh, particular image. So people had to relearn how to not flinch, how to not run away, how to not expect violence from this tool that at first had been used to cultivate, you understand? So I observed some of these things. Even the idea of children, the concept of it had changed in Sierra Leone. Before the war, children were looked at just these very innocent young people, but then we were all used as children to fight in war. So a lot of adults had a lot of time to readjust to see children as just these innocent people because these children had killed people in front of them. So there's a lot of undoing and remaking that needed to happen. So I saw some of these things and then I tried to create characters around these sort of events. Okay, thank you. Oreva, um, your book explores a lot of issues. Uh, it has, it deals with abuse, it deals with loss, it deals with betrayal. Um, why did you decide to tell this story? What was the motivation for you? And of course, it's, al it's also heavily about women. Um, so what was the motivation for you in telling the story? Okay, hello everybody. Um, first off, I'd like to start with the fact that I, in an all-woman household, I have four sisters and no brother. 
Um, my mom has no brother. And just, there's just six girls and no brother. So I've grown up a lo around a whole lot of women. And so technically, when I wanted to write a book, I was obviously going to write about women. At, with the first draft of Absolution, it was only going to be about the main character, Tamno, who had amnesia. And that was born out of one day I sat in my room and I thought about the fact that what if I could erase, you know, all the bad things that happened to me. It's like stuff has happened to me and I could just forget all about it. Would that make it hurt less? How would that be for me? And that was where I figured I want to write about amnesia. Um, and so that birthed the main character. As for the second character, Ella, has is a story of loss. And I'd like to say, like, if you put five women and five of them are going through stuff, at least four of them are going through relationship problems, yeah? So women um, mostly struggle with, you know, emotional issues. And I was wondering, how do you get over something that wasn't bad? Like, it's easy to get over a toxic relationship, somebody who was horrible to you, somebody who did the worst. You know, it's easy to just <laughs> disassociate. But what happens when everything was perfect and then the person dies? How do you move on from that? How do you, how do you, nobody really talks about moving on from that. So I said, I want to write about that. And then for the third lady, that was Sheila, who was abused. Um, also, um, and talking to, um, going to school, talking to some of my friends, I realized that everybody had an, I was raped when I was small story. I was abused maybe by an uncle, by an auntie, by whoever, whomever. You just hear people say things like, um, this uncle touched me or this auntie touched me. And it always comes from people you would never imagine. It's like somebody who you've seen that is strong and put together, just say something like, I was raped when I was small. And I was like, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about people who don't look like their struggle. People who, a woman who has been through, you know, she's been raped, she's been, but nobody sees that she's struggling because she's not acting out in the way that people expect people who have been through such to act out. And I think that's what birthed, you know, the three major characters in the book. Um, so the last character, is that, is that something that you struggled with in writing her, um, in thinking about how to present abuse, in thinking about how to present her, not just as somebody that this horrible thing had happened to, but as a well-rounded character? Um, okay. Also, um, with Sheila, it was a bit hard in the sense that when you're talking of rape, and abuse is a very sensitive topic, so you have to actually be careful so you don't, you know, paint it in a way that is offensive to people who have been through that. At the same time, I was somebody who grew up with pedestals. Like, I started reading newspapers when I was three. I started, you know, I was that child that was in everything. And so nobody really expected me to struggle. Nobody expected me to... Um, I remember one time in secondary school, I said to my friend, like, man, I'm going through this. And she was like, ah, if you're going through something, what happens to the rest of us? So nobody really expected struggle from somebody like me. So it, was, it wasn't that difficult writing about that because I had been there. I had been in a place where, you know, I was, people had put me on a certain pedestal and nobody expected me to struggle, and nobody was aware of all that I was dealing with, all that I was struggling with. And I couldn't really tell anybody because, I mean, who do you talk to when everybody else is looking up to you? So, yeah, it, it, was, it was okay. Okay, thank you. Um, now we'll take short readings from both Ishmael and Oreva. Um, Ishmael, we'll start, we'll start with you, and then we'll talk more about the books. Okay, um, the context, brief context here is that uh, the, the characters in this book are all returning to a town after the war and they are rebuilding the town by even starting to clean up the bones of the people who had been killed and all the rest of it. So I'm just going to introduce you to uh, a little bit of that struggle to, to find uh, life in a place that, uh, where life had been destroyed quite some time. 
There was a time when the days in Imperi were longer and marked by elaborate conversations, tales, visiting friends and family, lying in hammocks under the shade and welcoming strangers with a calabash of cold water, going to the river for a swim or to watch children play diving games. Aspects of this life were there, but without the previous enthusiasm. Perhaps it was because a large part of the population was unsure what to expect out of their lives. They had gotten used to the fragility of things, but they knew they wanted something different from the elders, something new, though they didn't know exactly what or how to set about attaining this new life in their current condition. The simplicity that had once been life had become a burden, especially when it seemed everyone waited for something to do. In the silence of that waiting, memories of war were awakened, bringing restlessness and irritability. People didn't spend much time on their verandas anymore. Besides the farming that had started on a very small scale just for people to feed their families, everyone just sat around afraid to find pleasure in most things. Only incidents brought them together and reminded them of the need to mend themselves and their community. The day after his arrival, Bokari decided to show the town to Thomas and Umu. The twins held the long hands of their father as they ventured into the realities of stories he had told them. His quiet demeanor and even his strides were calmer than his children, whose impatience made him laugh, a slow, drawn-out laughter that made others smile. Umu and Thomas greeted people, the few who sat on verandas, the way their father had told them about how things used to be. Good morning. Was sleep generous to you and your family? Has the world greeted you kindly this morning? The children repeated to everyone they encountered. Most of the people ignored them and went inside their homes because these questions reminded them either of the families they no longer had or of the fact that the world was still cruel to them and they wanted to forget just a bit before facing the day. Some of the people laughed because they knew these old words didn't belong to the children who spoke them. Father, how come they do not respond the way you had told us? Is it because we are small and they don't know us from before? Umu asked. No, children, it, is because, it isn't because you are small. They will answer better with time. I am sure they will, Bokari said slightly ponderously as he wasn't sure when this would happen. The children didn't give up and the next person they greeted was Sila, who was standing under the stoop of his veranda looking at the sky and breathing in the morning air with a vigor that made the children laugh. When they greeted him, he responded in detail about how he and his children were and how they had slept and he asked the same questions to Bokari. While Sila was speaking, Hawa and Mada came onto the veranda and sat on an old wooden bench listening to their father and watching the visitors with eyes that hadn't completely been freed from sleep. Umu and Thomas' faces filled with joy as they experienced what their father had spoken of so many times. Afterward, they giggled and poked each other as the adults had a long conversation about the way things had been, how in the morning there used to be a man who would play the drum at 5 a.m., then again in the evening for dancing, and finally deep at night singing a quiet melody that summoned sleep for everyone. I used to dance to that drum every time I walked by from my farm. The sound cheered me cheered me up all the way to work, Sila said, mimicking some of the moves, crossing his feet over each other and quickly making the drum sound with his mouth. He was dancing so well that looking at him, the children forgot about his missing hand. Bokari joined in the dancing while telling Sila that he too had liked the drum, closing the night in particular. He also said it was actually how he met Kula, his wife, dancing in front of the drummer in the evening. While the adults reminisced, the children watched one another. Umu and Thomas clearly wanted to know why Hawa and Mada were missing arms and hands, but they didn't know when it was appropriate to interrupt the adults. So they stepped onto the veranda closer to their age mates to see if they had just put their hands inside their clothes as children do sometimes, especially in the morning 
when it was a bit colder. Umu even touched the stump of Mada's arm. He smiled awkwardly, trying to understand why this little girl didn't seem to understand that his hands were gone. Thank you, Oreva. Okay, so brief context before I read. I will be reading the concluding parts of chapter six and a little into chapter seven. Now what's happening here is the main character, whose name is Tamano, has suffered retrograde amnesia and she's now trying to find her pattern of life, trying to figure out who she was, who she is, who are her friends, trying to reconnect with her daughter, you know, and just trying to find her way. For the tenth time in the same minute, Tamna glanced at the clock on the wall. She couldn't sit still. They were supposed to be back by now. Why was it taking so much time? She had arranged the table with small plates of cookies, cake, and every other goodies that she could find. She even went out to get some ice cream and clear her head, yet they weren't back. How far was the place? She spent the rest of the time rehearsing all she was going to say. Before she knew it, she heard the horn for Michael's car. They were here, finally. Why was she so nervous? This was her kid, her child. Her palms became sweaty and she fidgeted as she tried to decide whether to sit or stand. Or she could go to her room and pretend she wasn't expecting them. She decided against that. That would make it seem like she didn't care enough. Finally, she settled on the couch and waited for what seemed like forever for them to walk through the door. Mommy! Her little girl screamed her name as she ran towards her. One look at the bundle of joy and Tamna forgot all she had planned to say. The girl was standing in front of her with large hopeful eyes waiting for her to say something, but she couldn't. She couldn't say a word. Mustering up all the courage left in her, she said the only word that came to her head. Hey baby, hi mommy, I have so much to tell you. I miss you so much and daddy says you can't see me because you've been in an accident. Is it true? Does it hurt? Tamano could feel tears well up in her eyes. She wouldn't cry, not here, not now. She had to get herself together for her little girl. Yes, it's true. It hurts a little, but I'll be fine. So does that mean I can come back to the house for finally? No, honey, but mommy will be coming to see you often. Come here and tell mommy everything. She opened her arms and let the child wiggle her way into her laps as something told, told her this was going to be a lengthy tale. Minutes passed and Tamna listened with fascination as her daughter told her everything there was to know. She told her about the girl in her class who she thinks doesn't really like her, about her new favorite teacher, about grandma's yummy rice and chicken, about Pam her teddy who was sick. The list was endless. She didn't have to say anything. All she had to do was sit there, smile, and enjoy the feel of her child in her arms. She was sorry when the time for Precious to go came. The girl was like a ray of sunshine, so happy and bubbly. She was glad that she listened to Dr. Femi. She had made progress. She still had a lot to learn about her daughter though, what she loved, things that frightened her, and her favorite snack. She was going to learn all of it. Now that meeting her daughter was out of the way, she set her mind on the next task ahead. Chapter seven. On the journey to self-discovery, one has to find the right set of people to steer them in the right direction. This was something Tamno had seen in one of those papers that he randomly shared around. She needed to meet new people. That's why she had decided to get dressed and attend the women's meeting Dr. Femi told her about. Tamno looked at a bunch of people in front of her with dismay. She was so lost. She had never seen so many women in one place at the same time before. They all seemed happy. She, on the other hand, well, she didn't know what she was feeling. There were so many people with different attitudes in here, she wondered how they ever got along. In the far end was this woman, all scarred and scraggly. She looked so fierce in her tank top and jeans, like she had no care in the world. Chewing her gum with such ferocity that Tamno was so sure she was going to bite her tongue. Then there was another one in front, small, petite, withdrawn, and very beautiful. This one looked too innocent to have any problems. She looked fragile, yes. That was the perfect word. At the other end was a group of women who she assumed were the single moms. They talked and laughed in hushed tones, exchanging glances every once in a while. 
She could go on and on to identify the different mixes in the crowd, but she was stopped short by the appearance of a woman who seemed to be in charge. She was clearly well along in years, but she carried herself with such grace that one had to wonder if she was really old. She had on a warm smile and greeted everyone graciously till she got to her seat in the front of the crowd. She had everyone's attention. Everybody was relaxed now, like they were all in agreement. There was only one point of focus. She opened her mouth and started to sing a beautiful song about the love and grace of God. Soon, everyone joined her. They sang with fulfillment and contentment. Tamna soon found herself longing to be a part of this warm sisterhood. She let her eyes roam around the room. Regardless of their obvious differences and lack of similarities, there was a bond that brought them together in unity. The love in the atmosphere was almost tangible. After the chorus was done, a short prayer was said and the meeting began. Women came out to share. That's what the moment was called, sharing moment. Testimonies, struggles, victories, people said all sorts of things. And Tamna silently wondered how you get so free that you air all of your dirty laundry to total strangers. In the world she lived in, no one cared about your achievement or struggle or whatever. But here it was different. When all the sharing was done, the woman from the beginning, who Tamna knew now to be Mommy Rebecca, was introduced. She came and addressed the crowd. There were not more than 25 people in that room, but Tamna felt strangely surrounded and comforted. This woman talked about Jesus and his love. Tamna knew about God and his infinite mercies. In fact, she had been in the church system for quite a while now, but she had never heard it this way. This, for her, was a whole new ball game. To this woman and, woman and most of the women sitting in the room, Jesus was personal. Someone could feel and relate with like a tangible presence. And at one point in time, Tamna felt like she could almost feel his presence in the room. It was truly amazing. At the end of it all, she felt herself wishing for it to go on and on and not end, because for the first time since the accident, she felt at peace. Sure, she still had questions and doubts and fears and insecurities, but right here, in this group of total strangers, she felt home. She felt none of that. It was almost as if she was completely okay, and right here, right now, in this group of total strangers, all her problems seemed to have vanished. Still mesmerized by the beauty and loveliness of it all, Tamna remained in her seat as everyone made small talk with one another and ate gladly the refreshment available. Tamna couldn't eat anything. She could not even get herself to leave her seat. Amazing, huh? Tamna turned to see who was talking to her. It was a young woman. She looked so scruffy in her weathered jeans and the slim scarf that she tied around her braids, chewing the donut in her hand like there was no other one. She went on chewing, totally ignoring Tamna's awkward stare. Don't worry, it'll pass away. It's a JJC feeling. So, what's your story? Huh? Story? Yeah, you know, like, what brought you here? Everyone has a story. Sheila, leave that young woman alone. This was a pretty petty woman from before. She had come to join the conversation and was now tugging at Sheila's arm. Hi, I'm Ella. Hope my friend here hasn't made you uncomfortable. Oh, come on now. I was only asking her a few questions, you know, getting to know. I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to the fine lady. What's your name, by the way? Tamano. Oh, hi, Tamano. Mind if I call you Tamano? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ereva. <laughs> I, I find it really fascinating how um, people are dealing with trauma at the base level, but in different ways in your book. Um, the way that they deal with the memory of loss and their trauma is to go back to the same place where these horrible things happened to them. And for you, your main character forgets, you know, she just forgets everything. She, ha she loses her memory and that's how she deals with her trauma. Um, I find that really fascinating. But I wanted to talk about community, in the, the role of community in dealing with trauma. Um, from the section you read, now this community has been rebuilt and children who didn't know how it was but who had heard how it was um, are returning and they find that it's not, it's not the, the image, the, the reality on ground is not what their parents have told them but everybody in this community is trying to rebuild their community. What do you think is, is there 
is trauma to be dealt with collectively? Is, is, is there healing in that? Or is it an individual struggle for everybody? Um, it, in the narrative, you know, uh, perhaps what I didn't mention earlier is that there are a cast of characters returning into Imperi, which is where the, the narrative, the book is set. And they range from older people, grandmothers, grandfathers, to children who were born uh, right at the end of the war, who do not have any memory of the war. And so those children had been told stories by their parents of how this land used to be good because the parents did not want to remember the bad things. And now they're all coming home, so they have those good memories of this place that does not have, reflect that story anymore. So there are complications because when they ask certain questions from those memories to others, it's going to bring up something for them. So you have that. Now, the way trauma works and how I try to envision it in this thing is that it's both uh, personal and it's also public. Um, because this community had experienced violence together and people had fled and experienced their own violence personally. And now they're all coming back and try to live together. And there are certain people within the communities who are, have also been responsible for bringing, inflicting the violence on this community. For example, you have some former child soldiers. You even had a boy who followed the family he had amputated uh, back into this community because he's trying to make amends with them. And so you have a lot of complications. So it's the idea of trying to decide where do we go from here? What do we do? Are we going to embark on revenge or the idea of a punitive measure to rebuild this community? Are we going to embark on a restorative measure? Is there an in-between? Uh, do we need to hold certain people responsible? And of course, there's no easy answer to this question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, therein lies the beauty of fiction. You don't necessarily have to have an answer. <laughs> you can explore it. Uh, so that's, that's what I try okay. to do. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Areva, um, can you talk about safe spaces for women? Because in the section you read, she, she's just met the two women who are going to become her friends and who are going to help her in dealing with what she's going through. So can you talk about your personal experience of safe spaces and how important they are? Like I said earlier, um, I was that one child who you know, was put on a pedestal and it was hard to speak about the things that I was going through at the time, um, majorly because nobody expected me to be struggling. But I think my only experience with a safe space was in my second year in school. It was something like what I had described in the book. There was a group of women, and I think then we called it the temple. And I remember my first meeting, and I would just watch people talk about what was going with them. It was a little like the AA meetings they have in these white movies that we watch. And I was just wondering, why are you telling strange people your story? And for weeks, I wasn't able to come out and express myself. But I realized that when eventually I was able to express myself, there's something freeing about sharing what you're going through. You might not necessarily get a solution in that, in that instant. Like, you tell somebody, I'm going through this. The person might not have an answer for you, but there's a release in your spirit when you share, when you're able to talk to somebody and you see the person's face and you can tell in that moment, I'm not being judged for this. I am not being, this person has this, I understand. There's something, it's just, there's a kind of healing I cannot really explain that comes from that. And I feel like there's not so much of that around, but because there are people who would snitch and go and use your secrets too. But that being said, when you really find you know, a safe space, a space where you can go without feeling judged, without being questioned, without being, um, you know, you just feel free, there's a release in your spirit that cannot even be explained. Speaking about spirits, um, religion, when I was reading your book, I felt like, at some point I was like, wait, is it a Christian novel? I wasn't sure, because you know, there were constant references to God. Um, even in the section that you read, it's, it's a religious meeting. Um, and I wanted to know what, what your thoughts are about religion as, as a tool for healing. Um, okay, so I am Christian, probably Christian. 
Um, and when I set out to write absolution, um, I didn't say, oh, I want to write a Christian book. I just wanted to write a story. But like I always say, it's more than a religion for me. It's a way of life. So definitely, there's certain influences um, in my writing. You will hear me reference God every now and then and all of that. Um, that being said, um, religion as a way of healing, I believe... I believe that there's only so much as man that you can do for yourself. There's only so much, um, you know, a person can do for you. Let me give this example. My experience with healing, more than talking to people, more than ex um, telling people, oh, this is what I went through. Um, it was the first person I was able to ex properly open up to was like, it was easy to pray because I couldn't see him. I couldn't tell if he was judging me or not, so, oh well. It was easy to say, um, dear Jesus, I've done this and this and that, and I'm a really shitty person, but I know that you love me, I know that you accept me. It was easy because I couldn't, there was no way I could tell if I was being judged. And when I finished, there was no thunder striking me dead. There was nothing of that <laughs> sort. So it was just easy for me. So that, that, Doing that, I kept on, you know, constant communication. And for me, I saw results. And I felt, okay, this helped with my healing. So definitely yeah. in writing, you know, that there, there was... It reflected your experience. Yes, it had to reflect one, some way or the other. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Ishmael, um, my last question for you before we open, it, open the floor to the audience. Language. Even from the beginning of the book, you, you mentioned wanting to bring um, the oral tradition of storytelling into the writing. And for those of you who haven't read the book, you should absolutely get it. When you're reading it, um, you, you, you know that the writer is not thinking in English. You know, um, it's like the, the descriptiveness of it is not something that English language used ordinarily can capture. Um, and I wanted you to talk about what language you were thinking in, um, why you chose to write to translate it into English as much as possible instead of writing in that language. Um, well, first to, to start with, you know, I think one of the things as, as, as writers from the African continent or African writers, we are blessed with the fact that uh, we are coming from a part of the world that has many, many languages and these languages have their beauties in them. Though, as a young boy going to school, I was told not to speak any of my languages in school. It was considered a vernacular. And I was actually flogged to speak. <laughs> I remember this very well. Um, and so, I tried not, when I was writing this book, uh, and when I became a writer, I started realizing that the English language was not sufficient to express certain things that I wanted to express from the languages that were in my head. And all my characters, when I think of them, do not speak English. They speak other languages. So I have to then translate within my head and it arrives on the page in English. So that process itself redefined the English language and finds a new version of English for me. Uh, I will give you Sierra Leone, uh, we have, uh, it, it's pales compared to Nigeria, but we have, <laughs> we have uh, 13 languages and three dialects. And so as a kid growing up, I knew seven of those just because I was born in a certain environment, right? So in Mende, which is my mother tongue, for example, when you say night came suddenly, the translation means the sky rolled over and changed its sides. So if I had the choice of saying, oh, night came suddenly or the sky rolled over, obviously I would use the latter, right? <laughs> now everybody else outside of the African continent would say, but that Ishmael is so good with but, you know, his prose is so nice. In my village, they will say, but this boy, even a small boy can say that, you know. <laughs> but anyway, but that's, the, that's the advantage we have, you know. So when I was writing, I really wanted to bring that, that liveliness in our language and also the fact that our languages are alive. For example, pidgin. The pidgin that you know today, next year, it will be different because there will be new slangs added to it. Our language constantly evolves and changes. So I wanted to bring all of that liveliness and that beauty in it. And one last example I'll make, for example, with a ball. In English, you say a ball, right? I say the children kicked around a ball. In Mende, a ball is called fefete, which means a nest of air or a vessel that carries around air. 
So because when we speak about an object, we speak about the components of that object. So if I say the children kicked around a nest of air, a vessel that carries air, hey, New York Times bestseller right away, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So the point of this for people who are here who want to write is that you have to rely on your culture, your background, your languages. These things are very important in shaping your prose the way you want it. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're running out of time. Um, but we'll take a few questions from the audience. So, show of hands, anybody with questions? Okay. Okay, so one, two. Hi. Please. Okay. Good evening. Uh, virtually, it's not a question I'm going to ask. Uh, okay, I'm Ahmed. I am just going to put some comments. Uh, and uh, for either uh, sister, I want to say uh, thank you very much for not compromising your religion because it's a way of life. It's a, it's a yardstick. Because if you don't advocate it, which one will you advocate? And because you have, you're writing something related to that. Uh, I'm a Muslim, but when I'm writing something related to that, I can put my own religion too, because we don't have to forget it. They are the two strongest social institutions. Please let's keep it. And uh, for you, Mr. Ishmael, I really want to appreciate you for not also forgetting your culture. Yes. Thank I think you. Today Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Um, okay, there was somebody else and then... My name is Elisayo. I'd like to find out, um, or ever, I find what you um, wrote about interest in amnesia, and I'm just wondering, you know, we see it many times in films, you know. It's easy to see on screen, and I'm just wondering, how does one write about, you know, amnesia, like this person has forgotten? I, I, how did, did you decide, um, I want to write about, how did this story come to you, and how did you write this condition into this character? Okay, let's take the last question and then um, sure. Hi, this question is for Is Ishmael. So without wanting to reveal too much about the book, um, there's a part of the, as the story goes on, we discover that this post-war this post society, this post-trauma society, um, finds that it now has to deal with a new kind of, um, a new desperation as people are looking for new ways to make a living and uh, an innocence is lost in the sense that corruption creeps in. Um, um, for example, the teacher who was, um, I think, stealing from the school. I read this principal. book a long time ago, sorry. I'm sorry, not with The principal, oh. yes. Uh, the principal, yes. Um, there was the, the multinational that was hiring men from, the, from that town um, that was doing shady deals. So uh, there's a new kind of corruption that crept into the society that no one remembered from the past. That, bo that came out of this, this new situation of hardship. I don't know if you want to say something about, about that. Um. Okay, so definitely no more questions. Areva, um, okay. please answer. So writing about amnesia, like I said earlier, um, I decided to write about amnesia because I was thinking, what if I could forget all you know, the bad things that happened to me? Yes, but in writing about it, Funny thing was, I joined a group. I was doing some research, and I did research for close to a year. Um, but I joined a, somewhere in the middle. I joined. A, I stumbled on a group of people who had who have amnesia and are struggling with memory loss. And I don't know why. Maybe okay. Of course, I was wondering why they assumed that I had amnesia. So, a couple of people would text me, you know, how about, how do people remember? And I'm just like, yo, I can't remember. But they thought I had lost my memory. So, I had a couple, I was speaking to a lot of them. And one of the things that one of them said to me that kind of stuck, I was like, the movies make amnesia like, you know, you, you, something happens to you. And then you forget. And then somewhere in the ending, you remember Maybe you hit your head and you, and you know, and she was saying that, you know, nobody ever talks about not remembering. And so I thought to myself, um, and so I started talking to a couple of them and there are people who have lived 10, 20, 
30 something years and they never remember. They never remember. And it's hard. It's hard. No, I mean, for some of us who have our memories, we're struggling to find who we are. Am I gay? Am I not gay? Am I a Christian? Am I a Muslim? Am I, do I like ice cream or yogurt? So this is we who have active memories working. So now think about not being able to remember. You know, you're suspicious of everybody and everything. Is this person lying? Is this person telling the truth? And you're just, it's just an identity crisis in an extreme form. So, yeah, um, I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Ishmael? Um, one of my uh, favorite writers amongst many um, is an Algerian writer uh, was uh, by the name of Albert Camus. And I'll paraphrase something that he had said, which is that the role of a writer is not to represent those who make history, but rather those who suffer history. And I come from those who suffer history. I was born in a very remote part of my country. And so when I, if I'm writing something, I'm always trying to find a story that and represent a certain point of view of people or open a small window into the lives of those who people may not necessarily know about or never hear about. So what you're talking about in this uh, novel that I opened was this idea of desperation that comes about in a post-war environment where people do want to continue on with their lives and then they have to make compromises on their moral and their ethics, even on their religion, to be able to live. So you have a scenario where there was a school being rebuilt, being revived, and the principal, though well-meaning, is very corrupt because it's a character that pays school fees for some of the kids, but he also adds names of teachers on the payroll that do not exist. So what do you do with somebody like that? You, he's, he's a necessary evil to some extent. In addition, a mining company comes up in Imperi when the characters have returned that then started destroying the land. And from the African point of view, particularly from Sierra Leone, uh, during the war, we knew the war was horrible in all kinds of ways and villages were burned down, but there was always a physicality we could return to, to our land, where our grandparents are buried. So we knew that would always, we can come back with whatever psychological damage. But the new mining company now, what he was doing was destroying the physicality of the land, where they would destroy the cemetery and they would flood it with a dam in order to dig the, the mineral. So the community did not know what to do with that. They want to live. But how do they give their land and their heritage and their history away if they want to live? So this is the dilemma that the new community found. And you can find this in most African countries where mining deals. In my case, for sure, this came, this imaginary version of it came from something that actually was happened in my country, which is that one of our really amazing leaders in Africa, in Sierra Leone, this is a, it's a sarcasm, you don't know what I'm saying, by the way, <laughs> decided to sign a deal that was a 99-year deal with a mining company that had the worst human rights record. Basically, for 99 years, this mining company was not supposed to pay any revenues or tax to Sierra Leone, and they would do whatever they wanted. I don't even know where that comes from, you know, because he got some money or whatever he got was not. So then this company just started using bulldozers and they would basically unearth and dig cemeteries. And you would see clots and bones hanging and they would just throw it out. I witnessed this in my own country. So when you see that and when you see what that does, because we believe in the spirits of people, when you see what that does to a community, I wanted to have this in, in this novel, a little version of that, an imaginary version of it. Of course, when the book came out, my government was not very happy, so they put out a statement. <laughs> That's when I thought I did a good job. I was like, okay, if they're reacting to that. <laughs> so in spite, of it being, in spite of it being labeled as fiction, your government had a reaction oh, to Oh, yes, that. but that was exactly my response. They were like, hey, you boy, you know, why are you telling that this is what we did to people? I was like, did, it says a novel. <laughs> it's fiction. So if you're getting up on getting all upset, there must be something really wrong yeah. with you. Do you want us to write a journalistic piece about that? <laughs> and then they kept quiet, so I guess. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Ishmael. Thank you, Areva. And thank you, guys. You're so wonderful. Staying so late, and thank you. Thank you.